good morning. Why don't you stand up and join us this morning? If you're joining online, welcome to Tree of Life in Pflugerville, Texas. Come on, let's just begin to give him thanks this morning. Open up your gates. Acknowledge his presence. The Lord is here this morning. Come on, release your sound, release your song. Doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as I love you, Jesus. You can sing in the spirit. you to come and have your way this morning move amongst your people we've come to encounter you Lord and we just bless your name this morning because you alone are worthy Your name lives 
crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. Let's sing it again, all the saints and angels. All the saints and angels bow before your
deserve all the glory. You deserve all the praise. You deserve all the glory. You deserve all the praise. Jesus, you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy to receive all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. We exalt you. We lift you high, oh Lord. church. <laughs> I am Susan Nestloni. <laughs> Our pastors are taking a little mini vacay, so I hope they have fun and get rest and rested and are doing amazing. I'm like, how do I come down? <laughs> I got my notes here. I'm trying. Okay. So how, how's everybody? You good? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome uh, this church family, this beautiful church family. Uh, thank you, everybody here and online. Uh, we are so glad you're with us. If you are a new guest, we just ask that we have a guest. We have a gift for you. If you are brand new to us and we, you are important to us, uh, please get with Audra over here, and she has that gift for you. Um, this week, we are having Wednesday night service. That is November 29th at 7 p.m. We welcome Luke as he's going to share a special message for us. <laughs> Men's breakfast is coming up on Saturday, December 2nd from 8 to 10 here at the church. There will be breakfast tacos and coffee provided. I'm a little bit jealous. Just a little. If you have any questions, just get with Jack. This year, we are excited about the families and children that we are sponsoring, sponsoring with Angel Tree. If you would like to participate, please contact Rochelle or Jacob. Jacob is right over here um, about that. Uh, I personally know firsthand how Angel Tree really does reach out and touch the children one on one. You know, I mean, because I have children that were recipients of Angel Tree gifts. Uh, and they were allowed to have that gift from their dad that they couldn't have gotten otherwise. So anyway, if anybody knows or if anybody wants to participate, get with Jacob and Rochelle and they can do that with you. Kids Christmas practices on Sunday, December the 3rd. That is next weekend. Uh, Treehouse Kids will be practicing their Christmas song right after church and pizza will be served. Uh, the next book club meeting will be on Tuesday, December the 5th at 7 p.m. at Audra's house. This month, the group is reading A Million Little Choices by Tamara Alexander. Please bring your favorite treat to share. 
Uh, if you have any questions, just contact Pastor Cheryl. Uh, the Christmas special will be here at TOLC. It will be on Sunday, December the 10th during the service. And I hope everybody is doing amazing. And now we are welcoming our special speaker, and Jack Adams. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> would you guys be kind enough to pass out the offering? I see that you're doing that, the offering envelopes. Uh, I wanted to share a quick word on that, but first I want to ask a question. What is a really good reason why we should praise the Lord? Who's got a statement for me? This is proactive. That means I'm asking for information from, from our dearly beloveds. Yes. For all he's done for us. For all he's done for us. Anybody else? Yes. And the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I like that. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, sir. Say again. Um, why should you praise the Lord? Say again. What's he saying? Give Amen. Give thanks. Anybody else? Yes, Robert. Because he died on the cross by the sinners. Amen. 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 Because he has given us eternal life. There's a whole lot of reasons. Yes, ma'am. We are created to praise and worship God. Amen. We're created in to praise and worship the Lord. There's a couple other things that come to my mind. He inhabits the praises of his people. I just love that. So when you give yourself to praise the Lord and you make that conscious decision, what does He do? He inhabits your praises. In another psalm it says that He silences the foe and the avenger. So if you're struggling and the enemy's got you running and he's got you all beat up, if you choose to praise the Lord, He silences that lie. He silences those lies because the enemy cannot stand in the presence of the praise of the Lord because the Lord is light and all darkness has to flee away. So when you make that active choice to praise the Lord, then you've defeated the enemy in the name of Jesus. All right, I want to share a quick tithe message. This is out of the tithe, a book I wrote. Um, Come as a child. This is Matthew 18, verse 3. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. You guys can come on up. We'll pray in just a second. When I was a child, I simply believed my daddy. I did not worry about anything in life. I didn't worry about my clothes. I didn't worry about where I lived. I didn't worry about what I ate. Uh, I just simply believed my dad. That's exactly how God wants us to respond to him. So it says in Luke 6, 38, Give and it will be given to you. Pressed down, good measure, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the, measure, with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Let me give you an example. If my dad said, hey, if you'll mow the lawn, I will reward you. He was my dad. I didn't think he lied to me. I simply believed him. So I mowed the lawn, and what did he do? He gave me tickets to the Saturday theater where all the other kids went, and he went to the kiddie show, things of that nature. When he told me, he said, if you'll do your chores, I'll see that you have enough money to buy that $7 skateboard that you want so bad. So I did my chores, and when the skateboard came in, I had enough to pay for it. So quite frankly, I simply believed him because I knew that he loved me, and he cared for me, and he, he watched over me. So he was my dad, and I believed him. I did not overthink it. I simply did my chores, and guess what? I had more than enough. God says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. With what, what should we do? That's right. He's our dad. We should simply believe him. We don't need to make this a complicated exercise because it's not complicated. He's God. He's, he, we're not. Let's quit making it so complicated and come like a little child. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to give unto you because you have given us so much. 
And so, Father, we just pray that you bless our tithes and offerings as we open our hearts and give back unto you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. So we've got a lot of things going on, which <clears throat> Susan's already touched on some of them. The men's breakfast is next Saturday, 12 to 8 o'clock. need to remember that it's a good idea to bring a scripture and just kind of share, be ready to share what that scripture means to you. The stockings, um, we have an outreach for these Christmas stockings. These little blue things are here for a reason because there was only 10 men. And so if you were appointed a man, then attach one of those blue ribbons to it when you bring it in. Those are due by next Sunday, 12-3. We've got 65 of them. We've got a little ways to go. So bring them back full and ready to go. Um, on the angel tree, I'll touch on that again. She did not mention this, but the gifts are due 12-3, which is also next Sunday. So make sure you get the gifts back so we can give them to uh, the, the right people. Um, the youth, you may be released. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great meeting. We love you guys. Thanks for all that you do. Enjoy the Lord. The nursing home outreach, if you want to participate, everybody is invited. So what are we going to do? That's going to be on 12-9 Saturday, and that's going to be like 10 in the morning. To make it easy, we'll meet here at the church at 9:45, and we'll caravan over. So all we're going to do is go over there and sing Christmas carols. We've got a whole bunch of blankets that people have provided. We've got all these Christmas stockings. We plan on singing four or five Christmas carols and just letting those dear ones know that they're loved and they're cared for because God loves everybody. And I don't want to be rude or I'll just tell the truth. A lot of those people that are in nursing homes are just forgotten about. So we have a chance to go in there and love them and care for them and let them know that God loves them. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to sing four or five Christmas carols. I'll bring a message, and we'll give them all these gifts, and we'll uh, just cover them with God's love. Okay? Any questions on any of those things? Okay. I get to preach here once a year, so I'm excited about that. But also, everybody's traveling, so there's only half of us here, but that's okay. Uh, it just shows Mike doesn't trust me to a full congregation yet. <laughs> and that's okay so if I make a mistake he can fix it and he has fewer people to talk to and say he just really messed up I'm sorry but anyway we will press in and enjoy the Lord because God is gracious so our message today is out of John chapter 15 verse 15 that's where I'm starting I tend to use a whole lot of scriptures and I think they're going to be up on the board but we'll see hallelujah John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not understand what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, because everything I've learned from my Father, I've made known to you. So this was Jesus talking to his disciples not too long before he departed from the face of the earth. But out of that scripture, a very popular song sprung forth. I think it was 8 to 12 years ago, out of John 15, 15, is where the song came from, I am a friend of God. So I remember when that song came out, it was extremely hard for me to sing it because, you know, I'm kind of like the Missouri people. You got to show me. There's proof in the pudding. I got to know that I'm a friend of God. I can't just sing that song assuming that I'm a friend of God. So my heart went, what does it take to be a friend of God? So I was negated. I was not able to sing that song because I was afraid or I respected God enough to know, wait a minute, let me see the proof. So I had to do some research. So that's how my heart works. That's how my brain works when I'm coming to God. I got to know that it's real uh, before I can just jump up and worship God on a song like that. So the real question was, was I a friend of God? I knew that I was born again because in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. I went from not being aware of God's love to overnight. Now I was, able, I was not able to escape the love of God. It was around me constantly. I was indeed a different person. And that is available for any human being on the face of the earth. Put your faith in Christ Jesus our Lord because that's where salvation comes from. But the question was, 
Did that make me a friend of God? I wasn't sure of that. I needed to know, what does it take to be a friend of God? I knew that I was a child of God because in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, excuse me, uh, I knew I was a child of God because in John chapter 1, verse 12, all that received Him, that being Jesus, He gave the right to become a child of God. I had received Him. I knew that I had been born again into God's family, and God was my Father, and He would never leave me, forsake me. And that is available for any human being on the face of the earth because it is God's desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the nature of God. So put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But did that make me a friend of God? I did not know. And so I had to continue my search. Jesus speaking of a man's heart in Matthew 23, verse 25 through 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and dish so that the outside may become clean as well. I knew in my heart that I had been cleansed because it says in John, James 3.8, no man can tame the tongue. So I knew that he had done a, done a, a tremendous work in my life because quite frankly, I was an uneducated man. I, I got basically a ninth grade education. I'm just telling you guys the truth so you'll know. Uh, I did eventually go to college. I got a GD, but only went to college a year or two, so that really doesn't count much. But ninth grade education is where I came from. Basically didn't speak very well. And so I had a really large group of friends that I ran with, really wonderful guys. We were, you know, you, you guys that are my age know, understand what the good old boy crowd is. Well, I was part of the good old boy crowd. And there was about 30 of us, and we all fellowship. But I cursed like a sailor. I would say every fifth word out of my mouth was a curse word. Well, why did I do that? Because I thought it made me feel intelligent. That's my ignorant thinking. That's what I thought. And so it was, just, it was just like getting up in the morning to have a curse word flow out of my mouth. It was just automatic. I couldn't stop it. It was just automatic. But instantly, when God stepped into my life and baptized me in the Holy Spirit, my heart became clean, and that was gone. Just like that. So I knew, the Bible says, no man can tame your tongue, but Jesus can tame your tongue. Because He had cleaned the inside of the cup first. And now I became clean. And that's available for anybody on the face of the earth. Why? Because God is not a respecter of persons. So put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because He can do those things instantly in your life if you need them. But did that make me a friend of God? I didn't know. I needed the proof that I was a friend of God before I could willfully sing that song. It is written in Philippians 4.7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I knew that I had received God's peace, you see, because I was once a tormented man. I was so tormented that I contemplated suicide, things of that nature. I was so tormented that, that I didn't know if I could hang on much longer. But I went in my bedroom one night and I called out to the Lord with everything that I had within me. Now please keep in mind, I was instantly changed, but really there was five, ten years of me, of God planting seed in my life that finally brought me to that place. But I went in my bedroom and, and cried out to God one night with everything I had within me, and I said, if you are real, you have to prove yourself to me. You have to prove it, because I'm not going to believe it. I do believe there is a God. But I want, and I believe if there is a God, He must love us because He created us. So you've got to prove to me that that is real. And Jesus walked in my room that night. Now, guys, I didn't see Him with my human eyes, but there's no question that He was there. And I don't know why He does the things He does, but He knows our DNA, every one of us. He knows us inside out. He knows what you need. He knows what I need. And He picked me up like a little baby, just like that. And He rocked me in His arms. And he spoke wonderful things to me that night. And he told me that people would call out to me because I knew the way of salvation. He told me, and that's been true my whole life, people have come to me and said, do you know the way? Do you, do you, can you tell me about this God that you serve? And he told me that I would go to the nations. I didn't go to the nations for 25 years. But 25 years later, I did. And I've been in many countries in the world because of the things he spoke to me that night. 
My point is, God is not a respecter of persons. And what He did for me, He will do for you. He will reveal Himself to you because He loves you. He cares for you. And He's not a religious God that's stuck on the pages of a Bible. He's alive and well on the planet Earth. Remember, He rose from the grave. He's no longer in the grave. But He is spirit. You can't see Him, you can't touch Him, you can't feel Him. But He will move into your heart and He will make things known unto you. He will tell you things of your future just like He did to me that night. And I became a changed person. I walked out of that bedroom and I was different. And I had received the peace of God that passes all understanding. And for a tormented man, I used to say things in my young, ignorant, mm, ignorant youth. Not, I'm not going to say ignorant Christianity, but in, in my ignorant youth, in my Christian walk, I used to say things like, I didn't even, it didn't matter to me about eternal salvation, but it mattered to me that I had the peace of God. I mean, if my life ended and I didn't have eternity, I was okay at that point in my life because I had the peace of God. When you're a tormented person, and now you have the peace of God, it makes the world a difference. Matter of fact, not walking in the peace of God is absolutely foreign to me. I don't understand it when I'm not there. I'm going, what is this? And of course, it doesn't take me long to get back into His presence. But make no mistake, I'm 70 now. I'm no longer a young Christian. I've walked with God over 40 years. And yes, I covet the eternal salvation that we have and the eternal walk we're going to have with Him when we leave the face of the earth. It is wonderful, and it goes on into all eternity. Matter of fact, the Bible says that... One second, it'll come to me. That the increase of His government will continue all the days of your life. And that means on the face of this earth, where you are five years in your Christianity to 40 years in your Christianity, you won't be the same place. You will grow in the things of the Lord. You will become more peaceful. You'll become more like Jesus as you walk with Jesus. And then it goes on into eternity. And the increase of His government just keeps on growing. Mike likes to talk on those things a little bit from time to time. But the truth is, we ain't going to be bored when we go to be with Jesus. But that still did not answer the question. And the question was, was I a friend of God? I needed proof of that. I needed to know that that was the case. Acts 19.6 says, When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I knew that I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I was praying in tongues, I was prophesying, I was having dreams and visions, and things of that nature. When I walked out of that bedroom that night, I had spent, prior to that, two years in bad doctrine of people telling me, this is how you walk with God, this is how you receive salvation, blah, 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 blah. And they had me believe in that junk. But when I walked out of that room, you couldn't lie to me. That was one of the things that he did to me. And I don't know if any of you guys were, um, uh, it's not Star Wars, um, that one that was on TV, Star Trek, Star Trek thank you. Star Trek, but it was the next generation and they had the black blind guy that had this thing on his eyes and it would go back and forth like this. Y'all remember that guy? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's literally, and that's, this is no joke, guys. That's literally how I was. You could tell me anything about the kingdom of God and the spirit was just searching everything, searching, searching, searching. And he would just tell me that's truth, that's not truth, just like that. You could not lie to me. And it, it was so important in my life because I had been lied to for two years. And so now the Holy Spirit dwelt within me and He will bring you to all truth. That's one of His jobs. That's one of the things He does. And so He was searching everything that was told to me. But did that make me a friend of God? I did not know. I needed to know if I was a friend of God. It was very important to me because I wanted to sing that song. I wanted to sing it with all my heart. But I had to know, was I a friend of God? In Luke 10, 17 through 29, it says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us. He told them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, 
Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. I knew that my name was written in heaven. Why? Because when I cast out demons, they left. I'd come across them in my, in my tenure at preaching at missions and things of that nature. I've had them sit out in the congregation and try to mock me, and I've just told them to shut up in the name of Jesus, and they didn't open their mouth again. I've run into them in Nepal and in India, places like that, and they try to disturb services and they try to torment people, but they must go in the name of Jesus Christ. And those things were happening to me, and I knew that the power of God was invested in me, and I knew because of that that my name was written in heaven. I wasn't scared of the devil. I wasn't scared of Satan's tactics or anything of that nature. None of that feared me. Why? Because when Jesus was walking on the face of the earth and he was walking in the will of God, you might remember several times they wanted, one time they wanted to cast him off a hill, a cliff, and he just walked right through them. So when you're in the will of God, you don't have to worry about those kind of things. You don't have to worry about death and things of that nature because God's anointing is on you. And so you're going to finish your race. Does it mean that you might not be martyred? You might be martyred. But if you are martyred, you will have the grace of God to walk through that, smiling with the joy of the Lord on your, on your face. There's a, I used to read a book. Unfortunately, I left it on an airplane, which really grieved me, but I'd read it every year. And it was basically a list of all the original 12 um, <clears throat> and how they were martyred and about their lives. To, to the best of their ability, they told the story through original text and, and old writings and things of that nature. But Andrew was the one that I was amazed at because <clears throat> the, uh, the guy that decided to kill him put him on a cross and uh, didn't feed him or anything. And thousands of people came. They didn't put nails or anything. They tied him to the cross. Uh, thousands of people came to see him, and he continued to expound on the love of God for three or four days while he's hanging on a cross. That's the grace of God that comes upon you when you're walking in his will. That amazing grace, things of that nature. So you're not going to go before your time if you're walking in his will. And just because I wasn't scared of Satan and just because my name was written in heaven, did that mean that I was a friend of God? I did not know. My search continued. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and 57, it says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> I knew that I had received eternal life with the forgiveness of sins. You see... Prior to becoming a Christian, I feared death. I was, it horrified me. I remember the first time I saw a dead person, I didn't want to see that dead person because I knew that was the end result of all human beings and it scared me to death. But once you become a Christian and your name is written in heaven, you don't have to fear those things because the fear of death is what? It says it's sin. Sin has been satisfied. Jesus made a mockery of sin. Sin can't keep you from the kingdom of God. Are you hearing me? Sin cannot keep you from the kingdom of God. Jesus, the blood that He shed, washed away your sins and purified you so that you could have a new life. So sin no longer has a grip on you. It doesn't have a hold on you. It doesn't have the power to keep you out of God's kingdom. Jesus made a mockery of sin. He said, my blood has done it for you. And I have been raised from the dead and so shall you be raised from the dead. So sin had lost its grip on me. The sting of death was gone. I no longer feared death. I used to have people go, Jack, some of the things you do are crazy. I would go through, <clears throat> I would go through Cracktown in Nacogdoches, and I would pick, a, I had a, a white Sundance, brand new one, and it had dark, dark windows. And it just looked like a dealer's car. <laughs> Anyway, I, I picked up this husband, well, I don't know if they were married, this man and this woman, and, I, and I'm ministering the gospel to them the whole way, and, 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 and they want me to stop at this metro grocery store. Well, the metro grocery store is where a lot of the dealing went, went down, but the owner of the grocery store didn't like that stuff, so he comes and he raps on my window. 
clack, 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 clack. So I rolled my window down. He said, I don't want your kind around here. And the lady in the back, who I'll be nice, was a prostitute. And then she had her male friend with her. And she said, no, no, he's not one of those kind. He's a preacher. He's preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to me. You know? And one time I walked in and this was, oh gosh, I don't know, 35, 40, 35 years ago. And the, the black culture had just started not wearing belts and they'd wear their pants way down here. And I came to this young man, I said, dude, uh, I'll buy you a belt. <laughs> I didn't know that that was the style. I'll buy you a belt. And so he laughed at me and scorned, scorned me a little bit. And I said, well, where do you live? He says, I live right over there. And right over there is about 12 trailers. And it is a crack neighborhood. And I went, well, they need the Lord Jesus. So I waited until the sun went down. And it's cold. It's like in February. And it's probably 35, 40 degrees. And everybody's around the campfire shivering. And I, I, I'm the only white guy there. And I walk up among them. And they say, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to you because God loves you. And they received me, you know, but I didn't have any fear. Why would I fear death? My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I remember Jesus, so I always believed if I'm doing Jesus' will, I'm just going to walk right through Him until it's my time. And when it's my time, I'll have grace to be like Jesus. Jesus said, hold this sin not against them, for they know not what they do. That's the power that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's amazing that we can walk in the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, abides within us, and He'll give life to our mortal bodies. And that's available for everybody on the face of the earth because He's not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. If you want to walk with God, you can. It's that simple. Through Christ Jesus, He's done everything you need for life and godliness. But that still didn't change the fact that I could not worship with that song because I did not know if I was God's friend. So, in Go Ye Discipleship course, we spend one week on now that I'm a Christian, what evidence should I see? So, you know, some people that rubs the wrong way. But quite frankly, if you're a Christian, there should be evidence in your life that there's a Christian, that you are a Christian. You know, it just, it should be evident that the Holy Spirit is working in your life and you're being changed from glory to glory. So all those things that I've already shared with you that were going on in my life, they were evidence that I belong to God, that God loved me and I love God. That is evidence. That's called proof in the pudding. Um... But I still wanted to know, was I God's friend? I wanted to sing that song, but I wanted to make sure that I was correct when I sang it. So, <clears throat> Greg, I hope this doesn't rub you the wrong way. Probably won't. <laughs> In all my years of walking with God, I found that those that are gifted in writing music don't necessarily have lyrical doctrine correct. Amen. It's probably correct to them when they write it because they have a pure heart and God has done something mighty in their life. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> it's not necessarily doctrinally correct for everybody out there that might want to sing that song. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God works all things together for good, that those who love God are according, called according to His purpose. So that song may not have been doctrinally correct, excuse me, that song may have been doctrinally correct for the guy that wrote it, but it certainly wasn't doctrinally correct for most of the saints that were singing it. And I wasn't sure it was doctrinally correct for me, and that's why I couldn't sing it. Because I wanted my, my heart to be clean before God. I wanted to make sure... Before I opened my bowels and let the, let the praises of the Lord go, I wanted to make sure what I was singing was truly correct in my life. Not that I was a legalist, that's not what I'm saying. But I, I, it's just my walk with God. I had to make sure that I was clean. I want you to think, <clears throat> let's look back for a minute. Did you know that you can be a child of God, loved by God, and not be His friend?
Did you know you can be a child of God, loved by God, and not be his friend? That is actually the truth. And so here's the example. Think about your children for a minute. You love them. You care for them. That doesn't mean you like or approve of everything they do or say. Anybody that has more than one child will testify that that's the truth. You have one child, they may have been perfect. (laughs) You have two children, they're totally different. (laughs) And though they might love you, that doesn't mean that they care about your will, that they care about what is right in life because they're young and they're being trained in the things of the Lord. And it takes a while. They're rambunctious, they're rebellious. And so technically they're not being your friend, they're fighting against your will. The same is true in the kingdom of God. You can fight against the things of God. You can be His child. And you can fight against the things of God. Say, no, I don't want that in my life. And all these kinds of things. But that doesn't mean you're not His child. The disciple of Christ should absolutely want to be God's friend. The good news is, God loves us so much that He tells us in Philippians 6, 1, 6. These are the things I love about God, is these kind of scriptures. We have this promise, being confident of this, that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. That's a good God. He knows our stubborn nature. He knows we're hard-headed. He knows we may not want to forgive up, uh, give up a certain sin. He knows that we're rebellious. He knows that we're going to sin tomorrow, possibly. He knows all these things. And then he tells us, don't worry. Don't worry. I will. I believe in me more than I believe in you. That's, that would be God speaking. He believes in His Word more than He believes in your ability. And He says, I will finish the work that I started in you. So I really didn't have anything to fear because I knew even if I was not a friend of God, God would work that in me if I truly wanted to walk with Him. If I wanted to walk with Him with a pure heart. But you might say, Jack, you don't get it. I love salvation. I love being a Christian. However, I have absolutely no intention of doing what is required of me to be a friend of God. Kind of sounds like a rebellious teenager. The Lord would say, you are my child. You can take this as a prophetic word. You are my child, and I am faithful. Philippians 2.13. 213, we find, for God, I love this, listen closely, for God is the one working in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Once again, the heaviest part of all of that falls on God. Do we have a part to play? Yes, we have a part to play. But the major burden falls on God. He's your God, he's your father, he's your daddy. And He's going to continue to work with you and get you where you need to be. Because why? Because He wants you to portray Jesus on the face of the earth. The Bible says, Matthew 5, 14 and 15, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. That's us. You know that little song, Let Your Light Shine? I think we sang it when we went out um, witnessing a Saturday back or so. But God is going to keep working with you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what are the requirements to be a friend of God? Jesus put it this way in Matthew 22, 37, 38. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it goes on to say in verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything hangs on those two commandments. Everything. So that takes legalism that you might want to wander into to prove yourself worthy to God. It takes it out of the equation. It's all about the love. With God, it's always about the heart. If He has your heart, He has you. If he has your heart, he has you. So even if you're like me, I was very rebellious. I had what I called a stiff neck, very stiff neck. And you had to prove it to me in the scripture 
before I was going to humble myself before the Lord and let Him change me. I remember, and y'all have heard me say these things before, I did not believe you had to have a license or a ordination to preach the gospel because it says we're all ministers of the gospel. So literally, in my stiff neck, I refused to get ordained. There was a refusal there. I will not do that. And so those are the kind of things that were really hard for me to overcome. But God, who is faithful, He will change your will to act and do according to His good pleasure. I knew I didn't need a license or things of that nature. But I remember back in Nacogdoches when the Lord came to me and said, I want you to run the March for Jesus in all of East Texas. So it was a pretty big event. And I was going to be speaking at church after church after church after church, trying to rally the troops, get them to go out in the streets and the highways and byways and sing praises to the Lord with banners. Anybody remember March for Jesus? Okay, we got, we got a few. It was a huge event, and it went on for several years. Um, well, the Lord said, I want you to get ordained. And I went, what? That was my response. <laughs> I said, you know I don't want to get ordained. And he said, it's not for you, it's for them. And that pierced my heart. In other words, all those churches weren't going to receive me unless I had papers proving I was bona fide. <laughs> so now I had to get papers to prove I was a bona fide preacher man. And then I had the right to come and speak in their churches. And so that's why I got ordained. But those are the things that he did in my life to get rid of my stiff neck. You know, things of that nature. Um, it didn't matter to God, but it mattered to men. And I was be going to be ministering to men. Anyway, that was a very successful time. And I'm very grateful that, that God worked a lot of that stiff neck out of me. <clears throat> he will continue to change you from glory to glory if He's got your heart. So remember, if you've been in my discipleship class, you've heard me say it's always about your heart with God. It's not about legalism. It's always about your heart. He's not worried about what sin you are currently tied up in. That might ruffle some feathers. He's not. Jesus took care of that. He knows, he knows the power that is in Christ Jesus' blood. He knows that if He has your heart, he's not, that, that sin is just, you know, that's just whatever. It's like a fly flying around and He just swats it and He goes away. He can deal with that. He's already dealt with it at the cross. So you don't have to fear those kind of things because the enemy will come to you and say things like, yeah, you can't come back to God, you've sinned too much, blah, 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 blah. Baloney. Christ Jesus' blood was enough. It was enough. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm trying to say it's okay to walk in sin. That's not what I'm saying. But if sin is what's holding you back, you don't have to fret. Because if he's got your heart, he will move you away from that sin sooner or later. He will do it because He's faithful. He will work in you the will and it's too good to do His good pleasure. He will deliver you and He will continue to mold you into the image of God. So I'm still looking at what it takes to be a friend of God. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. If you speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. If you have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and have absolute faith so as to move mountains but not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and exult in the surrender of my body but not have love, I gain nothing. In reality, if you think about that for a second, it's kind of where Paul was when he was Saul when he was a Pharisee. He was doing all these things that he thought was right before God, but it was all legalism. You got it, and, and, and you know, the next set of scriptures I'm going to read are the scriptures people read at, at all these weddings, but it really shouldn't be used just for wedding scriptures. And, and it even becomes more impactful when you understand that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, he had probably already been beaten 40 times minus 1 Numerous times. He'd been beaten with rods, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been cold, he'd been naked, he'd been without food, and yet he's able to write this. Love is patient. 
Love is kind. It does not envy. Do you envy? Are you patient? Are you kind? It does not boast. It is not proud. Do you boast? Are you proud? It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Are you rude? Are you self-seeking? Are you easily angered? It keeps no record of wrongs. Ooh, that's powerful. How many of us keep records of wrongs with our children, with our spouses, with friends? Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And then it goes on to say, love never fails. Love never fails. This is God's love we're talking about. The Apostle Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. The love of God that you walk in toward your fellow man covers a multitude of sins in your life and in their lives. It opens the windows of heaven when you walk in that kind of love and that kind of forgiveness toward your fellow man. When they don't deserve it and you choose to walk in it anyway, it opens the windows of heaven for them to come in and receive Christ Jesus as Lord. Because it's mind-boggling to them. They can't understand that. How can this person do that? That is power. You have been given a God-given ability to cover a multitude of sins. The Apostle John put it this way in 1 John 1.10. Whoever loves his brother remains in the light, and there is no cause of stumbling in him. Wow. See, when we're walking in God's love toward our fellow man, we remain in the light of the gospel. And then we don't get tripped up so much. We don't stumble, we don't trip, we don't fall. We don't fall in, in the ditch on the side of the road because of our own selfish desires. A lot of times when we're having trouble, it's because we're selfish. But love keeps you from stumbling when you're walking in the love of God, in the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very powerful. And so what is the evidence that I'm a friend of God? That's what I was ultimately searching for. And so it starts off in John 15, 14. He says, you are my friend if you do what I command. Well, what has he commanded us to do? 15, 12 answers that question. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 1 John 4, 8. As God is love. So I want to look at that for just a second. Just to be clear, the love he's talking about is not just tolerating someone. I know that I'm supposed to love them, but I don't like them. I don't really like being around them, so I'm going to separate myself from them, and I'm going to give an appearance that I love them. That's not God's love. All of us have done that. I've done it. But it's not God's love. God's love embraces those individuals. God's love reaches out to those individuals. God's love helps them walk with God. And so if you have somebody in your life that that's where you're at with them, you need to go to your prayer closet. I've had to do it numerous times. And please understand, we can't do these things in our flesh. You can't do them in your flesh. It takes the power of the living God in you. The Spirit of God that lives within you, He will give life to your mortal bodies. That's the promise. And so when we see that we're acting contrary to the will of God, and we're just tolerating someone because and putting on a fake facade... So they will think that we love them, but I don't like their personality, I don't like the way they talk, I don't like the way they dress, I don't, I don't like the jokes they make, blah, 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 blah. Well, you're not helping that individual. You need to go to your prayer closet. I know I had to do it. There was one time, I won't mention names, but <clears throat> I was on a mission trip, 
and we had a very successful trip. At the end of the trip, I was fried. My brain was just shot. I could not comprehend. I, I couldn't think. I was just burn up. And, and, you know, everybody went into the main room and they were fellowshipping. And I said, hey, can I excuse myself and go lay down in the other room? Because I've got to rest. And they said, sure, that's fine. So they're all fellowshipping, having fun, enjoying each other's company. And, and so I lay down and rest and everything's fine. I get on the plane and come back to the States. <clears throat> and then I'm going on another mission trip about a month later. And uh, as soon as I get on the plane... I'm sitting next to this brother, and he opens his mouth. I went, oh, my gosh, it's him. <laughs> I'm fixing to be with him three more weeks. <laughs> I went, it's him. I went, God, you got to do something here, because <laughs> I'm in trouble. I could not. It was like a, a chalkboard. <laughs> and it was driving me batty. And, of course, I went to my prayer closet, because you can't gut it up. You can't gut it up and decide to love them. That's not how it works. you got to humble yourself before the Lord and get in your prayer closet and repent and say, God, I need your help, and that's what I did. And now I can love that brother. It doesn't matter uh, that it used to be offensive to me and really caused me problems. But remember, you got to seek the Lord. Humble yourself and come into His presence and let Him change you. And that's what happened. <clears throat> So, you don't want to fake love, you want God's love. <clears throat> in the name of Jesus, because Je God is love. Remember in John 3.16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is the nature of God. And this scripture in Ephesians 5.1 is always just, I marvel at it. It says, Be imitators of God. It wouldn't say that unless we can. Are you hearing me? Be imitators of God. Therefore, as beloved children, walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant, here's the catch, sacrificial offering to God. So that's what we are, as we are a sacrifice to God. To walk in God's love, we are literally a sacrifice to God. John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. We must remember that God, Jesus, laid down his life for the whole world. And he calls us to do the same thing, to lay down our lives. When he says lay down his life for your friends, he's really saying lay down your life for all humanity. And that is a sacrificial thing. That is crucifixion of your flesh. Knowing what God's will is and doing it you are crucifying your flesh. <laughs> Knowing what God's will is and refusing to do it, you're a clanging symbol. You're not really making a difference. And God wants you to make a difference on the face of the earth. So greater love has no one than this that he laid down his life for his friends. So that's what he's talking about. When he's talking about... <clears throat> I'm a friend of God. You have to be walking in the love of God. And so now that I understood that, I could sing that song because I realized that I was God's friend because I love humanity. And when I wasn't loving humanity, I was smart enough. I don't like the way that sounds. Um, I was convicted enough by the Holy Spirit to let him work in me to send me to my prayer closet when I wasn't acting in love. And then let him do a number on me. So we have a promise that goes with that. When we walk in this manner, we are truly a friend of God. So what is the benefit when you walk in the love of God? People get saved. And we walk in the joy of the Lord. And it addresses that in John 15, 11. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you. And your joy may be complete. So if you're a child of God, full of the Holy Spirit, and you're not walking in the love of God, your joy is not going to be complete. It can only be complete when you totally surrender to Him and let His love flow through you. And when the Holy Spirit convicts you of wrongdoing, then you go to your prayer closet and get clean. 
So now I could sing, I am a friend of God. So that was the proof in the pudding, was that I love humanity and I love people. And when I don't do it, I allow the Holy Spirit to convict me and I go to my prayer closet and get it corrected. So my question to you is, how many of you want to be a friend of God? Amen. I like that. Um, the Word of God, <clears throat> the way it works, Greg, could you come up, please? When you hear the Word, and if it convicts you, there's power to overcome those things. So if you need help in that area, I would ask you just to come up here, and I will pray for you guys. So if you think you need help in that area, come on up. If you don't feel you need help in that area, I am really excited. <laughs> Hallelujah. So everybody's doing good. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. I've given my life to you, says the Lord, so that you could serve me. That you could literally be like me. For it is my desire, says the Lord, that you walk as I walked on the face of the earth. For I will cleanse you for every sin that has plagued you. I will separate you from everything that has held you back. I will give you confidence in my kingdom. And you will learn my word as you spend time with me. For it is my desire that you discern evil from good. And that comes from knowing my word. So I encourage you, my children, spend time in my word. And I will separate darkness from life. Darkness from light in your life. I will free you of all your idiosyncrasies and you will walk in my power for I have loved you and given myself for you so that you can have new life in the name of Jesus Father I thank you for my brother
thank you for bearing with me. I want to thank you because God is gracious and he loves every one of us and he's going to live big in every one of us because you are the light of the world. Jesus rises in your heart every day. Choose Jesus. Don't choose the sins of your flesh. Don't choose your selfishness. Choose Jesus because he is the light of the world and when you choose Jesus, it sets people free and you walk in the joy of the Lord. Jesus. Okay? And be blessed. In Jesus' name. Amen.